Today I want to do a video, something I've touched on quite a bit before in various ways. I want to do, try to do a one-stop spot to find stuff about muzzle jump. Muzzle lift, muzzle rise, muzzle jump, muzzle flip, all the different things you can call it. But what we're talking about is when you shoot your rifle and the rifle comes up and down. Whether it's a little tiny bit or it's a large amount um, and you're trying to correct that. Well, I should say. First of all, um, I would say um, this is something to try and create more accuracy um, or to try and get the ability to spot your shots after you've shot um, or just trying to improve things in general. If it already all works for you and everything works perfectly and you have quarter inch or less groups and everything works perfectly then please no need to apply. Don't need to worry about it. You're sorted. You're done. Don't worry about it. I mean, the world of people who want to try and improve things and are dealing with muzzle jump, well, these are the steps that I go with. Um, I suppose, first of all, identifying you have muzzle jump or muzzle flip or all the different things you want to call it. I'll call it muzzle jump. Um, identifying you have that problem to start off with. The first clue you've got is when you pull the trigger and the gun moves, you obviously we all naturally blink for an, for an instance or, or shut an eye for an instant um, out of the normal thing that happens when something goes bang um, and then you find that your rifle has moved a fair way from it was you've lost your sight picture or there's enough movement to say something's going on is your first clue. The, the thing that I normally recommend for someone trying to make sure their rifle shooting well and they're shooting well um, in all forms and that's including trigger control and your form and all the other bits and pieces is to video yourself not a complex thing in this day and age. Take your smartphone, take a mate's smartphone, go to a side profile, get a decent picture of the whole you shooting, just the rifle, just your trigger, just bits and pieces, and do some images of, or just some little videos of the actual rifle being shot. Um, at that point, you'll find by the naked eye, sometimes you can't see some quite violent movements that happen too quick for the naked eye. In all the smartphones nowadays, you can go through and slow that image down and have a look and see what's actually happening. You will then get to see from fast movement where there's maybe a little tiny thing going on to where you slow it down, you get to see um, the different movements that'll be happening in the muzzle. I won't get too much into that moment, but you'll see what's going on. Once you've seen those movements, okay, then you have something to talk about. Then you have something to work with, and that's what I want to go through and try and diagnose what's causing it. Um, to a lot of people talking about stuff, they'll only talk about one thing causing muzzle jump. Um, there isn't just one thing. There's a there's numerous things that can cause it, and some of them aren't as obvious as you might think. To start off with, and probably the most common cause of muzzle jump um, would be your butt pad height. So having um, your rifle set up with a, in a standard hunting form. Um, and I'll get a standard sort of, here's an El Cheapo old, um, it's just a Remington 700, just a, one of the plastic um, stocks that comes with them. A little bit of a has classic hunting situation, not as bad as some, but not as good as it could be. Um, and you'll see out of this system here, it, the, where your butt pad height is versus where your action is, where your, if you went straight through where your bolt's going and where your shoulder's going to push, they've got a height difference here. Um, that there, in by its nature, when you have enough force, even though that's only a small little fulcrum point over a long rifle, when you have enough force, that's going to naturally cause that force to go up, to lift as it actually pushes. So as it pushes back, it's going to lift up over that fulcrum. Um, and I should qualify this, and I'll say it a few times through the equation, through what I'm talking about here, um, is that this is very relevant to the amount of force, the, the cartridge you're shooting. So when you're shooting a 17 Hornet or even a 223, um, in comparison to where you're shooting a 300 RAM or a 338 Lapua, um, everything gets exaggerated. The more force and the light of the rifle, uh, but the combination of the two, the more force, the more um, the light of the shooter, all that sort of stuff, all starts to make a small problem or something that isn't a problem although it isn't engineeringly perfect, it isn't a problem at all, turn into a problem as you, get, as you go up in the caliber. As there's more force going, it's going to, uh, it's going to enhance the, the situation. 
This here is not too bad. It's not as low as some hunting stocks that really come down a long way for getting an eye, uh, a sight picture flat down the barrel, more the more an iron sight tail set up, style setup where it comes right down and shooting in this format, you're going to get more muzzle lift, um, which isn't really an issue for offhand shooting, more a concern when you try and take that same stock and put it into a prone position or bench rear shooting when you wanted to shoot a cycle flat. But that is probably the most common starting point. So besides that, um, in the and I'll start to get into some other details. And I should say it can go from your muzzle brake causing issues to your stock, your chassis causing issues, the, the, the structure of here, which especially comes into around your butt pad side of things, down, oh, sorry, around your pistol grip side of things, down to where your butt pad is. Um, these all are places, um, and, and the overall combination of the rate, even to a degree what your bipod set up like, all these things can cause this problem. So we try and walk, work through it in a, in, a, in, a, in a progressive fashion to make sense of it all. Like I said, the most common thing, most rifles are set up and I suppose I would explain that as well. There is a balance between ergonomics um, and, and the usability of a rifle and the shootability of a rifle or how precision, it, it, um, or how much it's designed for precision shooting. Um, and of course, retailers and manufacturers and that sort of stuff are trying to get as many people as they can to buy their product and trying to make a product that does the, the moment you make a product a specific thing, you've lost half of your market in that place. So they try and keep it a little more flexible, a little more open in what they're designing. Um, and that's a little bit the reason why we uh, can make improvements to rifles rather than all being perfect right out of the shelf. We're taking them from, from a general purpose thing into a specific thing. And then there's a little bit of design concepts and that sort of stuff that go inside that. But let me work through it a little bit more. To start off with, butt pad height is a very important thing. It's actual height, where that, that center line is, the more power you've got, the more thump you've got in a simple mechanical sense. Um, I, I suppose I'll do that with a, a simple piece of wire to try and explain things. These are bent up to display, display other things down the track. But if you have a straight piece, um, get this off the, off the table. You have, um, I'll set this up so you can sort of see some of this sort of stuff. You have a straight piece of, of, of anything um, and you push directly from the back, which keep in mind, um, when the rifle is going bang, there are two things happening. Um, one is the bullet and the gas are shooting down the end of the barrel. So they are going down that direction and because of reality, it's Newton's first law, I think it is, but, uh, but that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So if you have something, an energy charging off in one direction, well, there's an equal force happening in the other direction. Now, obviously, when you've just got gas and a bullet that are from 50 grains to 800 grains, depending on what you're shooting, sh charging out here, or even a thousand grains, it's again, it's all the same physics. Um, you have a the them charging off here the, the the rifle the everything the shooter all that sort of stuff are a lot heavier but they still deal with the same force so they still are getting a shove of exactly the same energy in the other direction so that that also means for those people who aren't clear about that is that that force happens instantly so the whole time the bullet is accelerating down that barrel even though it might only be there for two or three or five hundredths of a second as it gets out that barrel, um, it is still, the rifle is feeling the force at the same time. So it's all starting to move backwards, it's all starting to react against the shooter, it's all starting the process as that bullet's moving. Um, and as said thousands of times, if it all happens completely consistently to the millisecond, then it'll always be dead accurate and go to exactly the same place. But the moment it is not completely consistent, the moment there is a variance in the hundredths of milliseconds, then that is going to be a point of aim difference. Um, and that's why getting your rifle to shoot flatter, getting it to cycle flatter, get it to shoot flatter is better because even though there still is that equal and opposite reaction of the barrel and the shooter all getting shoved, if it's all in a dead straight line, it has a lot less movement going on around it. If it's coming straight back versus going up, you can imagine 
on the way of going up if it if it actually comes to a stop point here as it releases the bullet versus a stop point here as it releases the bullet you get what's called stringing and all the other movements obviously cause movements if it's going straight back well straight back stopping here and straight back stopping here are still pointing straight ahead so let's that's a, a segue let's come back to this if you have something straight um, and you push, I will do the opposite, I'll put the force here, makes it easier for me to demonstrate it, but it's exactly the same thing. Force is going this way, and in our case, the shooter is the piece that's resisting it. So when you push straight, you'll find that it just goes straight backwards and forwards, there's no variance in it. And that's what we're really talking about. If you find here, and we'll go to the other direction, and use for this moment, it's a little harder to, to show, but if you are pushing from below that center point, and you push here, you'll see that we're getting, I'll get that right, it's hard to demonstrate, but you can see by the nature of things, as you push lower that center line, you're going to make it lift up. Now, keep in mind, and as you can watch right here, if there's very little force, and you push forward, even right down here, with very little force, it pushes dead straight. So in a very low caliber, in a 22 or things like that, we have very, very low force, there's a lot less energy involved. When you have very high force and I push down here, you can see what's actually happening. I'm not letting this move, I'm pushing down hard, and because of the nature where I'm pushing, you can see it's going up further. So it's very caliber orientated. So the butt pad height is very relevant, trying to keep that straight is an important detail. The next thing I would go into in the way of moving forward um, and talking about things is the shape of a chassis. Now this is quite a good stock and it's not, I'm not using this stock for to demonstrate that it's bad by any means. This is a modified, but it's a Bell and Carlson stock. Um, they are very good stock, very rigid stock, and I've really not had any issues with them. They have the adjustability. This is the, um, the A5, full adjustable. I've modified with, with a, some mods up the front and I'll set that up at about the right height. Um, uh, uh, that, that, that's about right. Um, I've modified with a bag rider on it and I've modified with some, some mods up the front to it, but basically it's the same thing. Um, and it is a very nice and rigid, this is a, this is a quite heavy um, fiberglass with, uh, with an um, aluminium chassis, aluminium through them. I haven't seen exactly the structure of them, but they're very strong, very rigid, and, and been great, really good value for money stock. I've, I've liked using them. Um, but it does a good demonstration of something else that I'm talking about. And that is that although this butt pads up at the right height um, to where it's in line with where the action is going to be coming through, you have this, which is very much designed about hand position, but you have this drop down and back up to get to that point. Now, in the fact that this is very rigid stuff, fiberglass doesn't like to bend, um, the aluminium frame doesn't like to bend, nothing wants to bend here. It's all very strong, it's already very rigid, it's weight, um, it is, um, we've got a decent amount of weight in it, but it is strong, not going to flex. So it means it doesn't have the issues. But if you go with the nature of this stock, the shape of this stock, um, you, if you haven't made this stuff out of rigid enough stuff, keep in mind, this one is, but there's many stocks out there, in, especially in the, in the plastic side of things, where they're using high density plastic and that side of injection model plastic. Um, some of the lighter weight um, carbon fiber stocks can have this use as well. Um, and it's obviously frame related as to the aluminum frame and the strength inside them. But that shape there can also cause us an issue. Um, once again, not something on this, but let's demonstrate this with, with another piece of wire. I'll put this one back down. If you have a look here, um, put this around so it makes sense. If you have a look here, I've got the same thing going on. In, in a gentle push, straight forward. And because the butt pad's high enough, a, a little bit firmer push, and we still get straight forward. A bit hard to do because I've actually got this bend in here. Now keep in mind, no stocks are made out of little pieces of wire, but this is to try and demonstrate what's really going on. You get your push to the right place, you push forward, See that there, that bend? As that bends, out of a straight push forward, you see the muzzle rising. And that's because of the nature of this bend here. Obviously, as this bends together, simply bends at that point, you see both ends raising. 
So you're actually the nature of the chassis is inclined to cause that unless that has been reinforced. You'll see on my um, Seiko TRG, it's one that with the weight I was running everything can get everything going there. I designed a little bar to go across the center of it. Um, the rifle shoots really well, don't get me wrong, but that's part of my um, design. I, I was doing things with muzzle brakes, which I learned about muzzle brakes. I'd certainly change things around and move things around, but it came to a point where I wasn't finding enough rigidity in that point. Did I actually prove it was an issue? Listen, it seemed to be a little bit better afterwards. I didn't get footage to be able to actually see that properly. I didn't have cameras enough to actually see what was going on, but it was the more that was the logic in my head that I was working with um, in trying to make sure that that, that bend there wasn't happening. Like I said, made out of strong enough stuff, and this is all in relevance, I should say. Strong enough stuff is a very general term. If it's a 223, if it's a 308, and it's made out of a, a normal, decent composite or aluminium that also do this as well, and then it's going to be way strong enough. If you've got that set and sitting behind a 408 Shytac or a, or a 300 rum, then you might find some other issues. It also is an issue in woodstocks when they start to get laminated started to go there. And I suppose I should touch on the woodstock side of it. There's a little woodstock. Um, and, and, and by and large with a woodstock, this is not an issue in a normal woodstock. The reason for that is they're shaped. It's a little bit to do with, um, it's a little bit to do with the way rifles were shot back then. The hand position's more crinked over, a bit more natural, a little bit more um, usable in an offhand side of things. But the truth of it is what it's really about in keeping it all very flat and why there generally isn't too much of a problem with an old fashioned sort of woodstock is it's all about the grain. You're trying to have strength. So you're having stuff that's in line. You get the thumb hole stocks and things that have straight wood across here. That's all in the same place to keep more strength in the wood rather than breaking wood. Less designed about the actual engineering of it and less ergonomic because it is dealing with it, but not generally an issue with that. But in the laminated stocks, it is something you watch out for. Some of them do go there. And that's also moves into, and I'll show you one here that isn't wood, but is this is synthetic, but this is the GRS stock, which has, for those that aren't familiar, has this offset feature through here to be able to get your hand on the, on the grip and that side of things. Um, very nice, very um, adjustable stocks, all full adjustment, that sort of stuff. The type of thing that can get into where you can raise your butt pad or if you get the right um, butt pad on them, you can raise your butt pad at the right height. Cheek rest adjustable, nice comfortable place to put your hand. Um, all very good, but keep in mind, um, it, I feel they're a color or a bit orientated as well. They are generally, those ones are a synthetic stock and I, I quite like them to shoot with them. The negative I found which is starting to push heavier weight is that this shape here does a little bit of this cut out the side um, to get good strength on the way through. So it's got a fairly good profile on that side of it. But on this side I found there's, I and I'm not sure I proved it, but really behaved that way, was the tiny bit of twist happening where the same thing's going, it's actually twisting the actual stock a little bit, um, wrong way around, twisting a little bit and actually moving the shot to one side a tiny bit. Once again, all, if all completely consistent, um, that's fine, but because it is a human on the back here and we are not completely consistent, um, I found I got a little more consistency in a staunch round uh, by changing to a different style of stock. Hunting, offhand, that sort of stuff, I get it, I understand it, I understand the logic to it, but like I said, it, it, it's all to be taken in consideration. Okay, well here's the chassis. This is a 223, this is quite a common design of chassis. It's, the, uh, it's an XLR chassis. Um, and the main reason I've got it up here is to talk about it because it is very similar to a lot with a buffer tube thread on the back of it and running a buffer tube tile butt stock on the back of it. Uh, and this one actually is a chassis we did a little bit of work with and I would qualify the fact that this one we dealt with a muzzle brake issue um, in the early days in a very with all this back end done and found the muzzle brake was a key ingredient. Not this muzzle brake, another one, and I'll get into that when I get there. But let's go down the back and talk about what we're talking. For those people who are familiar with this chassis, they will realise that there's some modifications I've done down here. One's very obvious, one's a normal thing. There's a bag rider that I've made on the bottom. I've made it out of steel, it's heavier. 
Um, it goes on the bottom here for it does give some more weight to it, weight to it which helps with the precision shooting. But it's a nice, decent bag rider, and it's got some more height in it, which means it gets it up to where I want to be shooting um, without having such a tall bag. So that's irrelevant to the conversation. What's relevant is this other bar that's different is this top bar up here. Another piece that I've made to put into it. Um, this chassis, the way it's set up, comes with, it has these two bars here, which are the adjustment bars, and this part on the back here with the butt stock is all that's there. This bar in the middle, it's not there in the normal one. Now, I won't pull it down out of, the, out of being time conservative, but that's not normally there. Now, in the logic of it, you've got the ability, it's adjustable butt pad, so you've got the ability to have that straight push that you're trying to line up with to get your butt pad up behind it, or where you, where you in my case, collarbone point is pushes against this, is immediately in line with the opposite, equal and opposite force that's coming back from the bullet, charging off in that direction. So, in theory, you're done. What I found in looking at it and, and in, in the concept of everything, I was dealing with another issue at the same time, but what I found when I looked at it is that where you're actually pushing, as much as you have a mechanical push up here, it's actually pushing through here. Um, it's not quite as bad as that because you are pushing the top, but what's, what it's allowing to happen is this is allowing to flex. Now, depending on the strength and the rigidity of things and depending on the mechanical push it's dealing with, the amount of energy, so the caliber or the cartridge you're shooting, would depend how much that's bending. But once that's getting to a point of bending, then it is starting to transfer the load from here rather than up at your point. And vice versa, if it's a low, cal low caliber cartridge, not a lot of energy, not a lot of push, shooting little bullets, that sort of stuff, then it's probably not going to bend at all and then it's working perfectly. But me being coming from the engineering side of things, I wanted to get this right and it was one of the things I tested with. Now I'll demonstrate that with this other piece of wire that I had built up for that, that exact test. Um, that's sort of what we're talking about. Everything's in line until the butt pad scoots around and goes over here. Uh, once again, pushing from the rear, you'll notice that if I push where I'm bending, what's actually happening is that bends. But if you look at your muzzle at the same time, you're getting it to push, to get it to lift up. And that's because this bend is causing this shape. And the moment you're doing that thing there, well, you're actually lifting the front of it. It's not a lot we're talking about there, but I'll probably have a hell there, you'll see more of what's going on. But you'll see in squeezing that together, you're getting that. So once you enter enough push, you're starting to see that thing. So for me, uh, once again, from the engineering side of things, and once again, relevant to the amount of push you're going on, um, is that this bar in the top here trans tr translates into, you can see that bar is slightly raised from this bar, and you can see that means that push point is pretty much right on this little bolt here. So we actually have a dead straight line. Something that help this rifle ultimately there was another fix to go with it but very relevant and I should touch on one of the reasons I comment about this and one of the things that I'm talking about with it is that um, I have heard fairly regularly people talk about listen I've got this rifle here and it's awesome it shoots really well it's in a 223 or it's in a 65 cream or it's in a 243 or it's a 308 or whatever it is and it shoots really wonderfully I love it love how it shoots so now I'm getting exactly the same rifle in this bigger calibre. Um, listen, that isn't always going to work. Um, and that is one of the things I'm talking about here. Um, once you go up in your calibres, all your engineering comes more into line. So there's places where a little light and maybe not the best design buttstock will still work flawlessly for someone because there's not enough shove going on. You take that and it was a 6.5 Creedmoor and go and buy yourself a 300 or a 338 Lapua in exactly the same rifle. You may well find that that engineering has just run right out of steam and you're going to start to have issues with it. Um, it is the case of the market finding something that works and then people want bigger calibers, so the big, bigger calibers, and they just take the same format and go there. They are trying to make sales. Um, and they, they really would prefer for someone to come in and buy something because they like it um, than to re-engineer it and turn it a different thing, which is going to have more cost to it, um, and then also lose that step up of sales of just buying another one. There are people that have bought three or four or five of exactly the same rifle, um, and the place where that design went well was in the little calibers, and in the larger calibers, they've got them, but maybe not quite as precise as they thought they would be. Anyway. Don't want to pick on anyone's brands, not mentioning any names, but 
I think you get where I'm coming from and understand the importance of the engineering down the back here. Anyway, so my, my overall comment is that, um, uh, well, I suppose I should touch on the chassis side of things. This is the buffer tube. There are lots of designs and there's some really smart skeleton stat chassis and that sort of stuff. They have all sorts of shapes in it. Um, this is all relevant. Aluminium, by the way, is not a unitanium piece of ingredients that has no flex and, and deals with everything. Um, the lighter a chassis gets, the more offset a chassis gets, or the buttstock gets, the more movement you're likely to have. Now, people who've redesigned things and pushed things, it is, um, it is generally all sorted out. But do understand there is marketing versus engineering, um, and that they, they are not always in the same place. And so keep in mind with that, largely, the more straightforward structure you've got, or the more where your structures end up, where you have your straight pushes and things are framed. So you have a lovely chassis, a butt stop that comes and ends up with the butt pad is down low, and then you've got to adjust it up. So there's a whole big wind room for that same sort of squish thing to happen. Okay, consider that as to maybe that's more of a lower caliber, um, and with less shove to it. Something's designed where this is up and really trying to get this in line by the nature of the design of it all, probably stronger. Um, and then that's all in, that can get into some real idiosyncrasies of that particular setup. But I think you get where I'm coming from there. So important point and in, in, its, in, its, um, in its complexities, it is probably the major point of causing this. Let's move forward a little bit. Um, the bipod. Listen, the bipod is something that is generally not going to be the cause of a problem, um, unless you are shooting it in a in a in, with a funny setup. Um, a precision shooting. This is this, this is the Atlas legs, as you'd know on here. Um, and if you drop this sort of system down to where you're shooting like that, um, to where the preload is causing movement, which is what you're going to get. Um, this is more likely to cause, when you shoot it, to cause the rifle to buck down because as it pushes back, it drags the legs back. Obviously, with no traction on your legs, not an issue. But once you're preloading or in the opposite direction or a similar thing, some of the Atlas, some of the Harris's, how they're set up, they're actually, they're actually um, on a chassis, they're actually going to cause a bit of stuff. Um, but to be truthful, in a normal straight leg bipod, um, they aren't going to induce muzzle jump, but what they can help you do when set up properly is absorb a little bit of it. Um, I like the long leg system because that rock that we get there that you can see um, is also, it's a very tall arc, so there's, it's very, I can't do it properly without a bag set up, but it's a very straight forward and back thing, so I like it for that nature. But the other thing about a bipod, um, in being able to preload and part of what we're doing is preloading um, and putting pressure into us is we're using both the feet of the bipod whether they're studs or their skids or their I mean spikes skids or their rubber pads or whatever it is is what I'm trying to do in my concept of it is create the ground to absorb a little bit of the shock create me the big squishy human to absorb the shock and with a strong chassis absorb it and transfer as much of the harmonics even harmonics out of the barrel transferring into things to where both the ground and the human are soaking them up to make for better shooting but really the bipod is more likely to show your problem and exaggerate your problem when you've got a rigid thing like a harris um, and it's sitting on a plow and it bounces around a lot it's generally not the bipod causing it um, it's generally the the um the fact that you have the problem and because it's on a bipod it's more it's more exacerbating the problem a um, little bit the same as shooting on on a bag or, or on, a, on a nice bench rest setup with a not set up rifle you get it jumping around and things because it doesn't have anywhere to absorb some of that stuff but the jump is still what we're talking about and I suppose that moves forward to the muzzle brake um, to a lot of degree and I think I've heard and tried to dispel but is that a smart muzzle brake will fix this problem. Um, and I would kill that right now. A muzzle brake does not fix muzzle jump. It can dampen it down, it can make it look like it disappeared, but, and it can create mu muzzle jump, but in no place should it be used to fix it. So let me qualify that. 
Um, the way I find, to, to be honest, the best setup rifle if you're going to get all the engineering right, the muzzle brake should not be needed to stop it jumping. Stop it hitting so hard for sure, but if you've got your rifle set up properly, even if it's a 50 cal and you're stupid enough to shoot something as a, like a 50 cal without a muzzle brake in the front of it and see how much it can break, um, it should still, if it's set up perfectly, it'll still push straight back. Now, going to that sort of level, generally you'll find you'll be squishing down on the back of the rifle so much that as it hits you, it comes straight back and as it hits you, it digs into the ground and lifts up because it's trying to shove you two blocks away. Um, but the, the beginning of that process should be dead flat. Um, and then in that situation, the muzzle brake does what it's supposed to do. It goes on and stops hitting so hard. It doesn't change the direction. There are muzzle brakes, and I'll show you one right now, like this. Muzzle brakes that are designed to stop muzzle rise. Well, they're not actually designed to stop muzzle rise. There's a couple of things, a couple of logics going on with this style. Now this is, they are nice, very effective, work really well, uh, muzzle brake. A few designs, this one's from Hinterland Shooting Supplies. Um, and for an average hunting rifle, there is a nice little bolt on to make it stop with muzzle rise really more about it has a flat bottom on here to stop the dirt go the, the the blast going down and blowing up dust and it's what i started 10 years ago whenever it was 15 years ago when i went back into proper shooting um elr stuff or, or extent long range and prone shooting out of the dirt shooting in dry dusty paddocks i was i started using this set up a few rifle with these and if you go through a lot of my clips you'll see these muzzle brakes on there now, as there was a black one on this one here, but this is where I started doing some of my testing. And when I did the process, I've stopped and realized I've got to look at what's actually happening, slow it down and analyze what's really happening. I found that with this sort of muzzle brake, that it's designed, like I said, to take a rifle that naturally shoots up and make it go down, make it hold and stay down. And for offhand and for bag shooting and that sort of stuff, it sort of does. Um, but it actually does more than that. And potentially you could tune it to just the right place, but I have some big issues with that. So let's go a little bit deeper into muzzle brakes. What's actually happening with a muzzle brake? Um, most people think that a muzzle brake happens of the gas just behind the bullet, so it doesn't matter. The bullet's gone and it doesn't matter what the muzzle brake's doing. Well, eh, wrong. Not how it works. There is a whole barrel full of air in front of the bullet that it's getting acceler accelerated at a monstrous speed. Um, because it's getting out of the road of the bullet and it's traveling at a monstrous speed. And that's the first shot of air to hit this. And it's actually hitting it and pushing as with a proper blast as, before the bullet comes. So if you have your muzzle brake tuning things on the front of it, um, as much as in all things I've said, if you are completely consistent, if you're the one in 58 trillion humans that is a completely consistent in the back of it or you're just completely lucky and you do everything exactly the same all the time then it'll work fine for you it doesn't matter you can be twirling around like a top and pull the trigger every time and hit your target spot on too i suppose if if you're that human but for most of us there's some flexibility involved in with the fact we are human so we don't want inconsistencies happening while we are making the bullet while the bullet is traveling out the barrel now if you have this blast of air that's coming forward that is hitting your barrel in front of the bullet, then there's a little movement happening just in front of the bullet. It's one of the negatives of shooting with a muzzle brake. So to, weigh, to make that negative not a negative um, is to make sure that your muzzle brake isn't doing anything with the tuning of the barrel. It isn't changing, I shouldn't say tuning, it isn't doing anything with the direction of the barrel or the muzzle blast. So you don't want it pushing it up, you don't want it pushing it down, you don't want it pushing it left, you don't push it right. You want it dead even in how it's pushing things. So that blast isn't doing nothing more than resisting the recoil onto you. And it's only a very small thing, but it still is you know, that shot of air that is you know, ending up traveling at 3,000 feet per second, would easily cut holes through pieces of cardboard. It's quite powerful. Although it's small and it's very short, it, it, it's an instant in time, it is still happening before the bullet actually leaves. So, that being said, that means that yes, the muzzle brake can affect the accuracy of the bullet. In these, what I found was actually happening was that that blast was actually causing, and when I slowed it down and analyzed it, and I've got some footage there to show that, I found that it was actually pushing the rifle down, and then so it would go 
down and then up and back forward and bounce bounce and it was getting a proper jump especially on my 338 getting a proper jump with it um, and in truth I didn't test this out of the genius of my brain instantly going oh that's going to happen I went through and made another muzzle brake and did that and started to do more flaring things to make it push down further and found I created worse uh, more of a problem and then when I went through and figured it out I figured out that there is a place where um, what was actually happening and this is the rifle one of the rifles at least that I put on a dead a neutral muzzle brake the, our muzzle brakes are flat to make sure the blast isn't going down on the ground so much but it also isn't going in the air too much it's going side to side dead even and it's very noticeable on this I'll put a footage some footage on here on this one shooting as well as to how much flatter it made things shoot but very relevant I would say there is um, a, a level of <coughs> not the perfect way to do things but something that can get around a problem when you have a chassis and you can't fix your chassis or don't want to fix your chassis that or, or stock that has a small problem in it, so there's a bit of flex going on then having the ability to tune a little bit drill some holes or, 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 or to tune a little bit and to put a little bit of blast back in the top here can make can make it shoot flat and make it shoot straight up by doing that I caution against it because of exactly what I just said the blast before it releases um, can make more inconsistency but it is still something for those people who want to play who are stuck with a chassis really don't want to move it and in truth I'm talking back about my TRG um, which I'll bring out and show the TRG now so we can say so I can finish off talking about that and making sense of things okay my TRG um, well with this fella um, I love the rifle. Um, it was my first big precision rifle I bought. It was 338 Rapua and it was really me doing a lot of learning to go with this. There's things that um, I love and there's things I don't so much love. I don't love how expensive the components on them. Uh, I, I do like the, the barrel, the action, um, the way the trigger works, all that sort of stuff I really like about them and I'm very proud to have such a lovely rifle. Have a lovely big Night Force Beast sitting on top of it. You know, it is a little bit um, it's not my big big ones, but well, not one of my big big ones, but it is um, really nice in, in lots of different ways. So let's stop going on about my rifle. What I have done is done a lot of modifying. Um, I, did, I had weights on the front in the early days. I had muzzle brakes, different ones. Like I said, I started with the likes of the hinterland shooting supplies and it did okay, <laughs> but it was bouncing pretty badly. I made other muzzle brakes. I ended up with this muzzle brake here which I modified. You see there's on the front edge there some little modifications. I had some little holes, some little ports in the top here to, to stop muzzle blast or to stop it jumping a little bit and try and settle it down. I've ended up with what I'm most happy with is one of my four port brakes on the front. But it, um, <laughs> and it was definitely a learning process for me. Um, this one has a, you know, there's, um, it has a nice low centre of gravity bipod, the TRG bipod, which I've used on other rifles as well, like it. Uh, but the things that I struggle with here was in the in the in the muzzle brake side of things was getting everything to shoot flat and getting this up and nice and high. That was really straightforward. But I still had a bit of jump. It was a little bit about the weight. I was definitely pushing the 300 gains. I was definitely pushing them quick. So there's a lot of thump going on. It's a three three straight the poor. It does like to kick a little bit. Um, and but one of the things that I really came into is in my opinion at least and maybe it's a little bit to do with the mods I've made to put a bag right and everything into it but really through here there's not enough strength in this funny composite material and the more I set up the more I tried to absorb more of that load the more I made me do it so me the human pushing on the back here really working fine the fact that I was getting I felt getting some movement through here so I made a modification I made something, a bar, that goes in under my custom cheek riser that is directly pushing to the chassis on the back here. So that touches the chassis, this piece of steel, that then goes through and touches this composite block, which is solid, that then goes through and pushes directly here. So there's just no give. That push there translates into push that's mechanical push, pretty much in it, where I can get a dead straight line. There is a little bit of a drop, but we're talking where it's still um, only just over the center line of it to where I'm getting a mechanical push through here. But in that process, that is still the design, and it is, I'd have to say, designed for a very nice, I really used to like laying my thumb immediately behind where this bar is now. 
and it's probably not quite as comfortable in the engineering I've done to get around that. Um, but I was still very happy, and I am very happy how this rifle shoots. But it is one that in the early days I got to shoot its flattest by designing a, this is a handmade muzzle brake, but having just, and then tuning just the right small ports on here just to help balance that chassis. I see it as a negative and it's why I've gone away with it because as much as this is making it push up, this is making it shoot flat, the two working together make it shoot dead straight, <laughs> I see potential um, discombobulation between the two. This one pushing down, this one pushing up, the two balancing together don't just necessarily evenly neat it out, um, um, evenly um, and neatly get rid of that problem. And of course, we're not, we're not actually talking about the problem of what it looks like to shoot. We're talking about trying to have that bullet releasing from the barrel when the barrel is moving in a dead straight direction. Okay. Well, in an overview at all, um, this is probably about what I can tell you about muzzle jump. As st I started with, there isn't one cure to, to muzzle jump. Um, there is varied things that can be involved with it. I generally start by looking at butt pad height. I certainly, out of what I've learned, look at what the muzzle brake's doing. Um, chassis design, butt pad design, all those things are very relevant and all of them are very relevant and I'd have to qualify and stress that because a rifle doesn't do it, um, or a rifle design doesn't do it in a smaller caliber, does not mean it's not going to do it in a larger caliber. To some degrees or another, you'll find that um, load development can be a little bit about that. You'll find the lower loads, not in all cases, but there's certainly places where the lower loads are where they shoot well, and the higher loads is where they don't shoot so well. In some cases, that's simply about recoil management, um, and muzzle jump is part of that whole process. Um, keep in mind, and I'd come back to where I started, if you shoot really well, if every, your rifle shoots really well, but it jumps and it's annoying in that level, but everything else shoots really well, I'd consider where I'm doing things. Of course, be honest about really well. One group where you had a clover leaf at 500 yards um, and, and the rest of them are not so crash hot is, uh, listen, I've done that before myself. Shot things that simply shouldn't have shot very well um, that were horrible to shoot but got really good group. That is not a walk away. That is if, if you really need convincing because the rifle wasn't shooting well enough and you know that, do another group. Make sure you can do it consistently. But this is that's what I'm really heading for. I'm really heading for trying to make sure it's consistent and keep in mind my main philosophy is not what the rifle does or the shooter does on a good day. It's what they do on a bad day and trying to make your bad day um, good days too. Anyway, um, give us a yell and a, or put down in the comments any stories or things that you want to share. Um, if you disagree with any sort of stuff, you're welcome to let me know. Uh, but that's my logic to come with it. I certainly go through the whole rifle, try and make sense of it. Butt pad first, look at the muzzle brake, what the chassis is actually designed like generally in my world heavier stronger but this stuff also works for the light side of things um yeah that's what i got to say hope that was worth something to somebody um other than that thanks for checking in on us and um we'll catch you next time hi guys sam here for folks that are interested in our products that you will have seen in our videos these are all products that mark has designed through our experience in elr shooting we manufacture them here ourselves the likes of our adjustable bag bases, bag riders, bipod systems, muzzle brakes, shot data recording sets, and even our great fun little 22 long rifle target. These are all available in our web store, the links to which are below this video, along with our contact information. And guys, we work hard at putting these videos together, so we appreciate all the help we can get. For those of you who haven't subscribed, don't forget, and hit the bell so you get notifications of when our videos come out. It would be awesome to get some financial support. So for those of you who can, you can purchase support bits on our web store which help us bring these videos to you. Thanks for watching. See you next time.